So this past month, we had the conferences of the two major political parties, and aside from all the headline-grabbing speeches and various fringe events, one thing in particular stood out to me, and that is how both our major parties are ultimately committed to austerity. And they may not call it that, they may not even use the word, but the fundamental agenda of shrinking the state, privatising everything that they can see, and cutting back on public services is simply on the agenda of both major parties. But someone reminded me the other day that a lot of the original debates over austerity are quite old at this point. I still remember the uh, March in March, the TUC organised in 2011, and how Ed Miliband spoke at it, and that was a very big deal. And that was 12 years ago. With both major parties hinting or openly committing to austerity again, I think it's useful to go through what exactly austerity is, not just what the word means, but the impact that it had on this country, the impact that it had on our public services, and what that might mean going forwards. I wanted to start by clarifying what I mean when I say the word austerity. I remember back in 2020, there was a lot of debate amongst Labour members when the party refused to support raising taxes on the rich. And a lot of people were saying to me, well, raising taxes on the rich is austerity. And that is incorrect. Austerity can be defined as a specific agenda of reducing the amount of public spending and increasing the amount of taxes on ordinary people with the specific goal of reducing the difference between the amount that the government raises in tax and the amount that it spends in a year. The budget deficit, or surplus if you have a positive number. Now there's a lot of things to say about how necessary that is, how much it even means at all, and there was a good discussion I had with Cameron Archibald on my podcast a few months ago, which I really recommend checking out, and I'll have a link to that below. But today I want to talk about the impact. Now, measuring the headline figure of how much we spend every year on public services, on government spending, is a little difficult. And you'll often see right-wingers saying there's no austerity, we're spending more money than ever. And that is true. But as we all know very too well, the value of money does not stay the same. So I find the best way to measure the amount of public spending we're doing is by looking at the share of GDP that we are spending on public services. And at the moment, we're spending about 44.5% of our gross domestic product, or GDP. Now, in measuring the impact of austerity, we have to look earlier than the last few years, because the COVID-19 crisis obviously necessitated a huge expansion in government spending that mainly focused on the health service, and thus doesn't really answer the question of what the impact of austerity was. So instead, I'm going to look at the period of 2010 to 2019, between 2010 and 2019, the share of GDP that we spent on public spending fell from 43% to 39%, which was a particularly harsh drop, given that most of the public spending that we'd been doing after the financial crisis was on staving off the financial crisis. It was on bailing out the banks, and the government responded by slashing public services specifically. If we look at which budgets took the biggest hit, the government's priorities become ever more apparent. The protection budget, which you know mainly encompasses police, fell by a whopping 31%. The education budget, 29%. The welfare budget, 26%. Even the defence budget took a hit. And in real terms, because these are all in real terms, by the way, adjusted for inflation, the health service, before the COVID-19 crisis, took a 6% cut. The only two areas of public spending to see a net increase in real terms in those nine years was pensions and, weirdly, transport. Which, I say weirdly, because I haven't really noticed transport getting any better in those nine years. To illustrate the concrete impact of these cuts, I want to focus on one specific area, which is education. Now, as I said, education spending fell by 29% as a share of GDP, uh, in that period of time, uh, which meant it fell from over 5.6% of GDP to 4.1% of GDP, which was a, a, a devastating drop. Um, but it's not just a question of how much money was being spent, it's where that money was going. And somewhere that it definitely wasn't going was teachers. Now, 
when you bring up the number of teachers, it's very easy for conservatives and right-wingers to say, well, the number of teachers is higher than it was in 2010. And that is true. But that's because population has grown. What we need to measure is the average class size. How many pupils per teacher? How many students is each teacher having to teach at a given time? And that has gone up by a lot. Back in 2010, 2011, it was around 15 pupils per teacher. By the end of 2019, it had risen to 16.3. And the scale of the increase measured across those nine years was pretty dramatic, as I'm sure you can see. Another consequence of these cuts was that the number of teachers has really begun to fall off quite badly in real terms. If we look at the number of vacancies for teachers in 2019, we can see there were over a thousand, which was an increase from the much, much lower number of less than 400 in 2010. Before I conclude, I also want to touch briefly on the overall impact on the economy. You may be quite surprised to hear this, but at one point in the late 2000s, our GDP per capita, so per person, was higher than the United States of America. Higher than the USA. Or certainly on par, I suppose if you take each GDP figure with a pinch of salt, we were not substantially poorer. But following the financial crisis, our countries pursued two different paths. Although America flirted with austerity at numerous points, when it came to things like bailing out the auto industry, spending public money, austerity was not consistently the policy of the United States in the 2010 to 19 period, but it was here. And the consequence was that the gap in GDP per capita between our two countries grew enormously. America's GDP is now $65,000 per capita, and in the UK, it's less than $43,000 per capita. And that is a remarkable change for two countries that were level pegging on this metric before the financial crisis. And let's not forget, the financial crisis hit America harder than the UK. The UK did this to itself. And the final thing I would observe, that again can be laid directly at the feet of austerity, is real wages, which is to say the amount you're getting paid adjusted for inflation over time to measure the actual value of your money. Recently, real wages surpassed what they were in 2007. And part of the reason for that is that the labour market became much more weighted towards workers in the aftermath of COVID and inflation has necessitated significant pay increases. But before COVID-19 struck the country, real wages were substantially lower than they were in 2007. And that is not normal. So, in short, austerity had a direct impact on our wages, our economy, our public services, and when it comes to education as an example, the number of teachers and the number of students per teacher in a class. And I can't cover all the impacts of austerity within a short video, but I hope that I've given you some indication as to the impact that it had and why we must work very hard to avoid austerity returning to becoming the common sense economic policy of both major parties, as it was from 2010 to 2015. Which incidentally, I will add, is something a lot of people in the commentariat seem to have forgotten. Thanks for watching. I will see you next time.